This happened when I was 16, still living in Portland, Oregon. My family and I had just moved to a new neighborhood, and I was walking back from my friend's house. It was around 9 at night, so it was dark. The path I walked on would take me through the woods for just a little while, and there wasn't anybody else in sight, but still. I decided to call my girlfriend while I walked home. We talked for about a half an hour while I kept walking. It got late enough that we were both tired and decided to hang up. I paused for a moment once we did. To this day, I'm fairly certain it wasn't anything paranormal. Mostly because if something like that had actually happened, I'd be running in fear right now. No, what happened was much more odd. The air went cold and it seemed like I could hear something moving through the woods towards me. It sounded like trees and branches were being torn up and things stomped on very heavily. Again, coming closer and closer to where I was standing at. My first thought, a bear. I better brace myself. This is just before we moved across the country. So maybe there were bears in the area that people hadn't seen yet. I don't know. I called my girlfriend back. I was hoping that talking to her would act as a distraction from what was going on around me. If there was some dangerous animal out there, at least she might be able to hear it. God forbid anything happened to me. Now, I should mention that there's about a stream, roughly 30 to 40 feet away from me, and through the valley, it created another sort of sounds. I kept listening to all the noises as we spoke, and trying to ignore what was coming towards me, but I just could not shake it. Then... It sounded like whatever animal this was had jumped in the water. I heard an enormous splash and trudging around through the water. After about 10 minutes of this nonsense, the sounds altogether just stopped, including the noises of the forest. I turned around, expecting to see something there, but nothing. I saw nothing out of the ordinary. I shrugged it off and kept walking. The entire way back, I cannot ignore the lingering feeling of dread creeping up on me, like a serial killer waiting to carve their next victim into a bloody pulp. The only thing keeping me from going insane was speaking to my girlfriend on the phone, and I was not telling her anything what was going on. I kept having this feeling like not only I was being watched, but something was creeping up on me, ever so closely. And at any given moment, if I just happened to look behind me, I swear I would see a black hand with claws reaching out to try and grab me, pulling me into the forest line. Everything was so quiet. It didn't make sense. I knew deep down in my gut, there's no bear that can make these noises, nor would a bear act like this. I was being stalked. I knew it. I could feel it. My instincts were firing off on all cylinders. I only had about a quarter mile of the trail loop left to get back on the sidewalk. And you could imagine, the entire way there was treacherous. Every step was pain. At any given moment, I was expecting not to make it. That something was going to burst out on the trail, grab me, and take me hostage. Either devouring me whole, or ripping me into pieces. Safe to say, through another agonizing seven minutes, I made it to the end of the trail. Yes, it took me about seven minutes to walk a quarter of a mile. It was a very, very windy path. Also, very uphill as well. Give me a break. About a week after this, me and my girlfriend come down to the same stream to sit and make out and spend time together. As we're sitting there, after we got done making out, my girlfriend is looking at the crawdads in the water, and she notices these massive prints in the dirt. She calls me over, and all around are these massive two sets of tracks. I realized to my horror that this same spot we were sitting at was the exact location that I'd heard the noises from about a week before, and all those memories came flooding back, rushing into my mind. I had completely forgotten about them before, but I did my best not to say anything. I did not want to scare my girlfriend more than she already was, but she was already getting pretty freaked out at this point and desperately was begging me to leave. The prints weren't sets of two, meaning something was standing up on two legs and was walking on two legs, all around the riverbed. They had moved up from the trees. I couldn't see any trace of where they started from, but it appeared as if whatever it was had walked out of this small stream and up into the tree line. 
I'm not good with estimations of measurement, but I'll say they were larger than my feet, which are twelves. And wider. It appeared to have four toes with claws at the end. So whatever it was, which by the way looked nothing like bear tracks. I've seen bear tracks before. These looked nothing like them. It was either some really heavy man wearing a Halloween costume for boots, or we had an encounter, or I came across an undiscovered species of predator. This was back in 2015, when I was spending a lot of time visiting friends in Southern Oregon and romping around in the National Forest down there. First, a little bit of a backstory on myself. I'm 39. Adventuring in the outdoors has always been a feat of mine. While I might not be as manly man as many of them may come, I feel very confident in my place in the outdoors and the forests. I've grown up around many family and friends who have hunted and tracked for a living, also felling trees and woodworking. My cousin is even a park ranger, so if that tells you anything, it's in our blood. While I may not actually be native to Oregon, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. It's like my secondary home. I've acquired many friends and secondary family through there, which means I've gotten the opportunity to hike, traverse, and travel through many of the amazing forestry and nature that region of the world holds. While I would like to consider myself somewhat of an animal expert, I realize this is not the case. After what happened here, I cannot identify all the predators that exist in the wild. And that holds true for my story. Oh, and one last note. I'm not much of a fan of going hiking on trails. I prefer to go out in the backcountry, as far as I can really be in touch with the wilderness and the wildlife there. Yes, the trails are safest if you're a novice. However, once you've gathered enough experience, it's a lot more enjoyable to see more of the uncharted territory. I try and make this a habit every time that I venture into a new region, whether that be a forest or mountain. You end up seeing a lot more that way than you ever would if you just stuck to the trails. Now, this was around May or June, if I'm remembering correctly. It was not quite summer yet. We did not have the blistering heat, which is part of the reason why we would go hiking for hours on end and me and a few friends of mine were spending hours hiking around their Fremont National Forest, which resides in southern Oregon. If you go further east, you'll end up in the desert pretty much. It looks a lot like Nevada, actually. So we wanted to stay within the confines of the greenery that the Pacific Northwest is well known for. We saw plenty of deer, a lot of other various wildlife, that is, until we came to a small valley located several miles off the nearest trail. This valley has a small stream running perpendicular through where the depression of the land is. If you already keep heading north, the land dips down more until it finally levels out. We believe that this stream, like most sources of water, are used as primary drinking spots and also act as primary food sources for most predators because everything has to drink. Whatever was taking all these animals out, probably hunted right down here. Which is why it's a good thing we did not choose to camp out down here. Now, upon entering this small valley, at first, we didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. Nothing was different from the other sections of forest that we had just gone through. But, as we began to descend down this very small incline, this horrible, musty odor began to waft through the air. It reminded me of old, sweaty gym clothes mixed with skunk or something close to that, while it reminded my friend of body odor very badly. Other than that, we did not notice anything else out of the ordinary or alarming up front. At first glance, the land is not one large depression. There's a small incline, and it levels out another small incline, and it levels out some more. There's a small incline, and it levels out. Another small incline, and it levels out some more. And it does this over and over until you get down to the river that runs perpendicular. Then, it continues to depress down further where it flattens out indefinitely. 
so we make our way all the way down the impression, which takes about 20 minutes, roughly. There was a lot more rocks down here than we initially thought, so you had to be careful not to fall. Upon coming closer to the small stream, the smell of decay was thick in the air, along with the sweet plant smells that spring brings you. My friend and I realized there must be a dead animal nearby. When out actually, there were multiple. We just didn't know it at first. The first one, we could see from where we were standing by the creek. It was a deer carcass, just shy of an adult, judging by the size of the doe. It was the manner in which she died that bothered us. She had not been eaten on, like most animals in the wild would. Typically, bears, coyotes, and wolves had tend to rip their prey up and devour them. Not so much with her. The head looked like it had been smashed in with a rock. The skull was heavily damaged. And her abdomen was ripped wide open. Her guts pulled out in a pile next to her body. I'd guess the kill was no older than two to three days at most. Judging by the smell and how fresh the kill looked, and the fact that her intestines had not been touched, it was anywhere between 70 to 75 degrees out, so the lack of any obvious decay or flies on the body did not make any sense. The rock in which her head was crushed with was nowhere to be found, or whatever object had done it, but something had flattened out and caved in her skull and face, which is what we assumed to be in the manner of which she died. I'll tell you one thing. She stunk real bad, as any dead animal does. We moved further down the stream, towards where the land depresses a little bit more, where the next kill was. Not even 120 yards away from the doe was a buck, or what was left of him. On the ground was his head, and one of his legs and his pile of guts, just like the doe. The rest of his body was gone. When I say the head of a buck, I mean literally the head. Not the skull, not the remains, not the bones, just the head, a torn up leg, and guts. Whatever had killed this buck tore the head off its body, and just casually seeming to toss it on the ground. That's exactly what this kill scene looked like. Also, appeared to have been dead within two to three days, and judging by the lack of decay on any tissue, no apparent flies or insects had gotten to the head. The torn off leg next to its head was mangled and broken. It looked to be torn off a little bit above the knee. Whatever had taken the head off this large buck did not bite it or cut it off. It looked to be clearly ripped. The only thing different about this buck versus the doe was that its eyeballs were missing, but everything else was fairly intact. For a somewhat fresh kill, the state was also present. Moving away further downstream, maybe another 65 yards, on the other side of the stream, we saw what looked to be several dead smaller doe, killed in a very similar manner. It looked as if somebody had just grabbed a hold of their abdomen, ripped it open with their bare hands, exposing their insides. Their guts, too, lay on the ground. No signs of eating in any way. No signs of decay. Although, it was roughly 30 feet away from us, across the other side of the stream. We were not close enough to observe the finer details, but from the smell alone, we could tell these kills were within 6 to 12 hours old. At this point, we began to feel a little bit like detectives, trying to wonder if maybe there had been a lone wolf type scenario with a mountain lion killing these animals for fun and not eating them. And to my knowledge, nothing kills just for the sake of killing, not when there's food that can be eaten on. As we begin to ascend down the depression even further, the musty smell gets much worse, where it had not been before. We had smelt coming down the incline, but it shortly wafted away, figuring it was just something in the wind being carried. But this was now much stronger. We followed the stream through a small bend, where it took us roughly another 200 yards, as my best guess, to a small, rocky crevice. This is where it seemed to dip down into the earth, creating an almost small den or a tunnel that expanded the larger you went down. This is what my friend and I assumed to be the den of whatever was killing all these deer. 
the musty smell was coming out of here very strongly. And even though we only had weak flashlights on us, we shined them down and I can see that there was a lot of old hair and bones that looked relatively familiar to a deer's, along with the small rocky floor. We did not feel like it was a good idea to venture further on into the den. We did not know what could be in there. The last thing we wanted is to wake up a bear or come face to face with a mountain lion. After backing out of this small crevice, we noticed around the other side of this large rock were several birds. Crows, actually. About seven in total. All stripped of their feathers, dead, on the ground, with their heads missing. All seven of them killed in the exact same way. The radius of their bodies was probably no more than 30 feet at most. I didn't notice this right away, but... About 50 feet up in a tree, a large pine, was a large doe hanging over a branch. Her head was missing as well, and her intestines were hanging out. This was clear that something was killing these things in a way that we could not comprehend. If there is any sign to leave the small valley, this was it. I don't want to say we were terrified, but we were starting to get scared. Natural predators do not kill this way and something had been doing a lot of killing, leaving the bodies for whatever reason. I'm trying to figure out still what possible incentive could any natural predator have. Not eating is the question. I still ask myself to this day. We had to say that we had seen enough, and make our way back up the incline, right where the stream is. That smell, that horrible smell that was on our way down, was now stronger than ever, meaning that whatever it was, coming close by. We were not about to shake hands with it. We moved hastily back up the incline and out of the valley. Having only spent a total of maybe an hour, if not a little more here altogether, it was more than enough time for us to move on. As soon as we had reached the top of the incline and the land had flattened back out again, the musty smell was gone. I don't feel like whatever the smell is coming from was following us. I never felt watched, or stalked, or nervous. I feel fairly confident and comfortable in the woods. I am also alert to my surroundings, hence why I picked up on all the little nuances down there. Same with my friend whom I hiked with, who is also very experienced and a little older than I. After the end, we spent a lot of time talking about what it could have been that would kill this way and not eat its prey. But we kept coming back with nothing. Not a thing made sense. I've turned to the internet multiple times and the results are unsatisfactory. So, I don't even want to give it the time of day. I'm not necessarily asking questions or speculating anymore. Instead, I'll leave the wondering up to you, the reader, of what could have been down there that day in the valley. Asserting itself as the alpha predator... What I can tell you is that the manner of killings does not line up with coyotes, wolves, or bears or mountain lions in any way. There is no known natural predator that resides in Oregon or the Pacific Northwest, as far as I'm concerned, that kills or behaves this way. It's mysterious. I've always loved the legends of haunted places, and of course, I had to make a trip out here to this beautiful site, an abandoned orphanage located in northern Oregon. The weather that day had been cloudy, a lot of fog, and out of all the places I had searched online, this was one of the best places that I could find. I had come alone, probably a mistake in hindsight, had I only known what I would have seen. The pastures surrounding this old building were long gone from being used. Everything was overgrown, unkempt, and basically falling apart. It hadn't looked like anybody had been here in quite a long time. That includes anybody to even coming back and repairing or fixing things up. This place seemed to have been abandoned since the early 50s, at the end of a long gravel road. And with the light rain and fog, it made it incredibly eerie. So, when I had stepped in my car, I was not ready for what I would see. Even just being there, and my heart had begun racing. I began taking pictures of the entrance and all around, just because of the creep factor. 
I was already on the edge of the woods, since this location was surrounded by dense foliage, and with it even being winter time, pine trees don't ever seem to enter into the winter period, where they all lose their leaves. As I had actually gone inside of this old abandoned orphanage, there wasn't much left. Just dirt and everything inside was practically crumbling. Again, making for an incredibly creepy atmosphere. I loved it. I began taking pictures. I brought my high-end DSLR as well. Since I use a lot of these old rustic photos as background and textures for my art projects. But here's the thing that sets my story from an urban exploration to one of horror. The orphanage was mostly one level, but had a long, winding staircase that led down to the basement or sublevel. Now down here, there wasn't much to see either. Same thing as above. Miscellaneous things and mainly just dirt and trash, or what was left of trash. And as soon as I got down to the sublevel, the smell of dog urine and blood were so strong it hit my nostrils as if somebody had just punched me right in the face, sucker punch style. It was enough to make me gag midway down the stairs, but I just assumed maybe a couple large dogs were living down here. I wasn't exactly sure what, so I kept going down the stairs, making it to the bottom, looking around. There was still some light shining into the windows that were up on the high end of the wall near the ceiling, so it wasn't pitch black down here. The smell was really bad, and there was only a long hallway, followed by about four or five rooms. Each room was pretty much empty, with a couple of broken windows, creating a cold draft blowing through. At the hallway at the very end to the left was a large room that what I assume at one point was possibly a classroom, but I can't be too sure. That room reeked like dog urine and blood very bad. There was also two dried-up deer carcasses in the room. It looked as if they had been brought down there and died. Long past stinking. They were practically mummified, and there wasn't a whole lot left of them. Most of the meat on them had been picked clean. But seeing how it was wintertime, flies aren't usually up and around, so I didn't think it was really predators. This body looked like it had to have been here for several months. My conclusion was that coyotes or wolves were coming down in here to sleep, or possibly a bear. I'm not really too familiar with the wildlife around here, so after seeing enough, I went back upstairs, looked around some more. As I'm getting ready to leave, I decide to call one of my close friends, who's also a huge fan and an avid urban exploration person. I tell her about the orphanage and the location. She actually comes and visits in a few days from now, but I go home, take care of all my photo and artwork things, and I get a call from her that evening. She was going to stop by on my house the next day, and she was actually hitting up that orphanage tonight. I told her to call me and let me know how it goes. I wished her farewell and good luck. Well, the next morning she comes over, and she's really uneasy. I get her to open up, which I'm pretty good at, and she's not one of those people that's quiet and reserved and won't say what's on their mind. I mean, maybe after a little bit, after I pried enough. But she began to tell me that when she went in there, she noticed this really awful stench. I had told her I had experienced the same thing, that it smelt really bad like wet dog and blood. She agreed. And as she was making her way down the staircase to check out the sublevel, she heard movement of something very big coming up the stairs. Very scared, she left the orphanage. Remember, this was also about one in the morning, when it was dark. So, she maybe assumed it was a homeless person, but she said the way they were coming up the stairs was very slow, and that means they must have been very, very large. It really creeped her out. She didn't stick around to find out who or what it was, and I don't really have any answers for her since I'm not the one that was there and experienced it, but it's certainly a story that creeps me out. My story takes place back when I was 18 in 2009. A group of friends and I were camping alongside the Rogue River in southwestern Oregon, right near Agnes. It was summer, so it was very bright out late. The night was still young, and after setting up our hammocks, we were all chatting away. 
our campsite was amazing. It was this nice little secluded spot off the road, right near the Rogue River. One friend of mine, who was a little bit older than the rest of us, went out for a walk to relieve himself. It had been probably about 20 minutes before he came back, and he was very quiet, which is very not like his character. He wasn't saying much. I looked at him and asked him if he was okay. He vaguely nodded. I didn't think too much of it and continued drinking and having a good time, but his character seemed to have changed. He was now very quiet, very reserved, and seemed bothered by something. I wasn't sure what, so I had asked him, are you sure everything is okay? And he looked back at me and nodded his head yet again. I did not want to let it go, so I decided to ask him again for a third time if he was okay, and he finally said back, yeah man, everything's cool. The tone in which he spoke sounded very forced, like something was really bothering him and he wanted nothing more than just to be left alone about it. He was not going to budge. I didn't know what to do, so I just left him alone. It was clear there was something deep down really bothering him, but there's nothing I could do if he would not open up. Our friends and I had been in the hammock for about over an hour, and we suddenly heard movement behind us. My friends in front of me were alerted to the movement, closer than I was. I watched their eyes as they became alerted to the movement behind us, and they called out. Now at this point, everything around us had gone very quiet. It was silent. My friend who had gone to pee was just sitting there, quiet, not doing anything, looking around. The two friends in front of me were now looking very concerned, and I figured we were being stalked by somebody, and maybe that's what he was so quiet about. We heard what sounded like growling noises, like a big bear or something and all of us jump up out of our hammock, expecting to see a large grizzly bear or something. But what we saw was something out of a nightmare. It did not fully come out of the trees, but we could see its tall ears poking through and what little light the fire allowed us to see. We saw a reddish-brown creature. It looked to be hunched over with very long arms that were reaching down to almost the ground. Its head was sort of cocked in my friend's direction, and it stared at him for a moment. I've never seen eyes so big in my life. I'll never forget them. When it turned its head back toward us, it opened its mouth and growled at us, then stood up fully on its two legs and ran off in the forest away from us. My story takes place on August 5th, 2013. I was coming up through Central Oregon, returning home from a trip that I'd taken to the coast. The time of day seemed like an important factor though. It would be getting dark in just a few hours, and I really wanted to put some miles behind me before it got too dark. So off I went. As the miles rolled under my wheels, I began to notice something odd. A lot of deer were jumping out in the highway, and they seemed spooked. i have been driving at night multiple times all throughout my life, and I've encountered deer running out in the road. But these deer they seemed spooked by something big, as if something was chasing them. Driving at night where there's a high deer population can prove to be dangerous, since deer are nocturnal, and if one hits your car, well, that's a total truck, and that's not fun. So I put on my brights for a little extra illumination as I traveled along these lonely roads. As more miles passed under my wheels, the safety became more problematic. Now, as I'm driving, I see something very large entering into my path onto the road, leaping directly into a beam of light. The shape was dark, and I see these tall pointed ears that reminded me somewhat of an elf, actually. And as I get closer to it, it looks exactly like the werewolf from the Van Helsing movie back in 2003. I nearly crapped my pants at seeing this thing. As I got closer, it turned its head in reaction to my car coming looked at me and leapt up into the air, past where I could see it, and past any visibility point. I believe it leapt over my truck and landed on the road behind me, but it all happened so fast it made my head spin. I couldn't even wrap my head around what was happening. Whatever this big wolf thing was had to have been the thing that had been chasing the deer out of the woods. So I wanted to ask, is Oregon in any way, shape, or form native to large wolves? 
ones that even might be able to stand up on their hind legs for a short amount of time. My friends and I were on a road trip to Crater Lake National Park, which is all the way in southern Oregon. We had several hours to get there, and there was not much to see where we were at, so we decided to take it easy for the night and camp out near the side of the road. We set up camp around somewhere around this abandoned land, or lake, about 10 miles from the nearest road. By road, I mean highway. Our plan was easy. Get some good shut-eye, get up again, and go on, back on the highway, and work our way down to Crater Lake. Right around 11 p.m., as we're all lying in our bed, we hear this very strange sound coming out of nowhere. It scared all of us silly. It was like somebody yelling into a megaphone near our campsite, and it lasted roughly five seconds. It just sounded like somebody yelling in pain, but it was very low in pitch and distorted. It scared all of us. My friends jolted up with their flashlights on. Our friends, just trying to keep everything and everybody calm, tried to convince us all it was a really loud owl, and that we should all try and go back to sleep. We still had another day of driving. Well, we tried, and around two in the morning, some seriously freaky stuff started happening. We kept hearing these strange noises coming by our tents. We didn't know what it was, but it would start off as a really loud bang, and then it would almost... But then, there would almost be this squeaking, screaming sound that we could not quite identify. And we would also see flashes of bright lights in the sky, like lightning, but not quite like lightning. And on top of all of that, we would keep hearing these really loud footsteps like something or someone was running all around the area. We'd shine our flashlights out at it, and nothing. We could not see a thing. But we could hear tree branches being broken and snapped, as if something big was tromping around the woods. But no matter how many times we'd shine our light, there was never anything to see. No shadows or silhouettes. The night was a horrible one. As much as most of us wanted to believe it was nothing, we all could not deny the obvious dread that was now upon us. But finally, at about 5 a.m., just as the sun was creeping up, and our phones were almost dead from using them as flashlights, we decided that we we're going to book it and just get a bunch of coffee and get on the road. I'm also going to take this moment to explain my story just a little bit better. Even though we were driving down to Crater Lake, it was getting late. My friend decided that instead of being convenient, and finding a nice spot right off the highway, we should go off-roading and try and look for a place as far away as possible, miles near maybe some forest or maybe a lake to camp out at, just, you know, in the spirit of Oregon. He was very adamant about it too, and we spent about two hours all in all getting about 10 miles away from the highway, so hopefully that explains the reasons and why. It was his idea, not mine. I thought it was dumb. I would have much rather slept in the car at a rest stop all night, but hey. We gave him crap for the rest of the trip, which wasn't very long, about what we had experienced. Some of my friends joked about aliens and Bigfoot, while other of us joked about ghosts. But in reality, it was pretty spooky, and we have no idea what beings or creatures are out in the woods that night. They clearly did not want us around. I was only 21 when this happened, and had just gotten out of a very, very toxic relationship. I was also addicted to heroin, and some other drugs that I won't mention. In order to get myself clean, I moved clear across the country, to move in with a friend of mine who lived just south of a small town near Salem, Oregon. This was a friend of mine whom we met over Call of Duty and played together for many years, and became very close friends. Well, after I told him about my situation, he invited me to come crash on his couch for a while to help get my life together and figure the change of scenery and surroundings would help me. And he was right, to an extent. I moved out there in 2008, and within two months, he helped hook me up with a good job in my own apartment. All of which was a great start, since my family life back home was not great, and I didn't really have the most trustworthy friends. You know, when they're drug addicts, all they do is bring you down, but... That's besides the point. I'll go ahead and skip past my boring life story, and fast forward you up to the point to where this event took place. 
So I got a job at a lumber mill and had been working there for several months at this point. I moved out of my state and into my friend's apartment in February. By the end of March, I had a job secured, and pretty much by the beginning of May, I had my own apartment. Now this was roughly June or July, so now it was summer. It was my job to go around to various job sites where lumber was being collected. I would work pretty grueling hours sometimes, dark 30 to dark 30, as I like to say. My paychecks were great, but sometimes it wasn't worth it. I'd get up before dawn and go to sleep after dusk most days of the week. And even some days, depending on the conditions, the work was difficult, for sure. This was until the event. One day, I had come to one of my job sites, and several of the other workers were complaining about a strange noise off in the trees nearby. It was giving them very bad headaches. I wasn't quite sure what to respond to them with, assuming maybe they should probably just take aspirin or ibuprofen and move on with their shift. I didn't notice anything myself, but while I was there overseeing some of the men, I started to notice this loud ringing sound. It started off as a faint noise, but it was almost like a constant high-pitched frequency sound. I ignored it after a while, but over time, it began to get louder and more intense, giving me a pounding migraine. Many of us on that job site also noticed it, and reported the same symptoms and problems. This would go on for several weeks, all of varying degrees. Some days we'd barely hear it. Other days it would be really bad. But what can you do? Just push on and get your job done. This was until one day. Now we're probably at the end of July, beginning of August. We're at the same job site, and just like usual, that frequency sound pops up again. It reminded me a lot of that loud ringing that you'll get in your ear sometimes except more intense. So we all began hearing it again, and by about two or three weeks into this, we're fairly desensitized to it. Hearing it is nothing new out of the ordinary, until one of my men starts screaming, and he points. We look up, and over by the trees is what looks to be the shape of a human levitating or floating above the tree line, probably about 90 feet up in the air, and descending even more in a straight path. The figure was pitch black, there was no detail or definition at all. And the further they ascended, that high-pitched noise left with it. And they ascended faster and faster and higher until they were completely out of view. Of course, all of us, including myself and my men, were completely shocked and astonished by what we had seen. With some of my men having a mental breakdown, thinking they had just seen a UFO. I had no idea what to make of it or how to even put the pieces together but I just try to rally everyone together, keep everybody going on the job, and make sure it did not distract us from our workly quota. But of course, I'm also a human, and after work, I cannot help but think of it constantly, having no idea what we had just saw, whether that be an alien or something of the paranormal. So anytime anybody on the job would try and talk to me about it or bring it up in conversation, I would quickly shoot them down and tell them to either discuss it outside of work or not talk about it at all. I knew that if that became the new hot work topic, either my employment would be questioned, or it would distract my men from doing their job. I couldn't have either. I'm not really a believer in the things that go bump in the night, but this was something so in the realm of X-Files and the Twilight Zone, I am just at a complete loss. I'll share my story. I don't know if this was a dogman or what it was, so I'll let you guys be the judge. It was February of 2008. I was living in a small mobile home park on the outskirts of Grants Pass. This is in southern Oregon, not too far from the border of California. Grants Pass is pretty much a hole in the wall for a town. Ain't much around. It's got a couple of things here and there, but ain't much. And our mobile home park was even further away from that. We're pretty out there in the middle of nowhere. Our trailer at the time was not even connected to electricity. We were using all of our own gas to heat up water and heat up the oven. This happened at roughly 9 p.m. at night. I had bent down to open the oven door, and there's a small window right above the kitchen sink, right near the oven. I was putting a lasagna in the oven, and as I close the door and go to stand back up, I'm startled by what I see staring at me through the window 
I just see these glowing red eyes attached to this amorphous shadow of something dog-like, but no real detail at all because it was dark outside. I began screaming, and then the figure quickly moved to the right. My husband races over to me, asks me what's the problem. I tell him exactly what I saw. He grabs his gun, runs out there, and is looking around. Meanwhile, I'm beginning to panic, because in my mind, it was a bear, but bears don't have eyes like that did. Once he steps foot outside, he's out there for at least five minutes, and I'm calling to him, making sure he's okay, but he's not responding. So, now I'm beginning to get very nervous, and I hear a couple gunshots, and running. Now, my heart is racing. He jumps back in the trailer, closes the door and locks it, and he is wide-eyed. He looks at me and says, That ain't no bear. And within a minute, something big rams into the side of our mobile home with so much force that it rattled the entire thing. Now I'm screaming. My husband calls 911 as fast as he can and tells them there's a large bear attacking our trailer. So we get a sheriff that comes out here and tries to talk to my husband. And they go outside and they're talking for probably about 10 minutes. I can tell they're looking around for something. And of course, dinner's getting cold at this point. I'm completely petrified by what's out there. I have no idea what it was. And I hear my husband calling out to me. So I step outside and he's there with the sheriff. They both have pretty serious looks on their faces. They both have large flashlights. The sheriff points down to the ground. And so does my husband. They both motion for me to look. Down on the ground, near our trailer, going back to the thick forest right behind us, are these massive canine prints. And that's not all. They were in sets of two. Not sets of four like a dog should be. I look back at my husband. So we saw a large dog, I remember asking him. There's something else, though, is what he mentions. Look at the tracks. Look at the gait and the stride. This isn't normal for a dog. This means it was walking on its hind legs. And it walked off into the brush, back over that way. And he shined the light. He told me and the sheriff right there, when I shot it, it screamed and fled back. But I was in the trailer at the time and I never heard it scream. So I went back inside to keep warm because it was February and it was pretty cold outside. Him and the sheriff talked more and nothing really else happened that night. But it was certainly one of the most frightening things I've ever endured. I haven't had nightmares about it for days afterwards. About waking up and seeing this dark shadow with red eyes looking into my window at me terrifying me. Years later, I would learn about a thing called the Michigan Dogman and hear reports about it in stories. And that's now where I kind of look back and can cross-reference some details from my story to stories about the Dogman, which is why it makes me think that that's what I encountered that night, but I can't be sure. After all, maybe it could have been a bear, but that doesn't explain the red eyes or the way that it walked or the thing that my husband shot at or the dog prints in sets of two not to mention how large they were. There's just a lot of unanswered questions that I have. All of them make me wonder. For many years, possibly the rest of my life, I've been aware that something strange happened to me while I visited Oregon. It was years ago, around 2009. I was camping alone at a spot that I'd camped numerous times before when visiting the state. The weather was beautiful and sunny all day long. Seasons change sometimes without notice, but not in Oregon. I had reached my camping spot quite early, so I pitched my tent right away and got all my supplies out and ready to explore the immediate area. After doing that, I set out on a walk around. After doing so for a while, I came upon a small glade in the forest. It was in that area where something happened to me I never thought would. The weather was so perfect and beautiful out, and with it now getting to evening time, the sun was just peeking through the trees at the right moment, where the sun shines through and there's light reflecting on the ground. It was breathtaking. I decided to take my backpack off and lean up and rest against a large deciduous tree. It was so perfect, you couldn't help but get sleepy-eyed. 
and so I'm sitting there, resting my eyes for just a moment, just taking in the serene, beautiful nature around me. I can hear the birds chirping, the squirrels chittering, and the wind calmly blowing. It reminded me of one of those audio clips that you would listen to while you fall asleep. I couldn't tell you how long it had been. It may be three to five minutes, maybe closer to ten. I was kind of nodding off, but I could feel the change. All of a sudden, there was just a sudden shift in the atmosphere around me. That's the only way how I know how to describe what happened. In the instant that took place, the squirrels stopped their chattering. The birds stopped chirping. Even the wind seemed to die down in that moment, and I immediately opened my eyes. I could feel it. Something was wrong. It's just this heavy feeling, like this foreboding, almost a premonition. This feeling in your gut that something really bad is about to happen, and it just came out of nowhere. And so I'm looking around thinking, okay, maybe somebody's here, maybe there's a bear nearby, there's got to be a reason for this. And so I'm scanning my surroundings, thinking, what could be the cause of this? And I start to hear this strange noise that I can't even begin to describe accurately. It sounded like somebody speaking gibberish or Chinese really fast or something. I don't know. But it also sounded very deep and very guttural, and maybe no more than 100 to 200 feet away. It was loud. Whatever was making the noise wasn't yelling, but... It was certainly loud enough that I could hear it from a distance. And then it stopped. And then the noise started up again to my left. Then back to my right. I realized in that moment that there were two animals or creatures communicating with each other, making this weird noise. And as they were doing it, they were coming closer and closer to the glade that I was in. I don't know why. I should have been more confused and curious, but I couldn't help but be overcome by fear. I don't know if it was fear of the unknown or fear what these things were, because I've never heard of an animal quite ever before make sounds like these did. I decided that that was a good time to leave. So I stood up, grabbed my backpack, and quickly moved out of the glade before these things got closer, all the while still communicating with each other as I left heading back to my campsite. About 15 minutes later, I get back to my campsite, and the forest around me is still very quiet. Even the birds have stopped. The squirrels have stopped chittering. It stayed pretty quiet and eerie all evening, until about nighttime, when I was sitting around the fire and noticed the crickets coming back. I have no way to account for what happened or what I experienced. I've asked a few of my friends this, and even they don't know. I even had one friend who supposedly had a Bigfoot encounter years back, but he even doesn't know. So I thought I'd reach out and ask you... What do you think it was? Could this have been two just animals communicating, or was this something else altogether? This was during the summer of 2011. I was working my summer job, basically mowing and doing yard work. It was right around 9 p.m., and I just finished mowing a lawn for an older lady. I had to take my riding mower back to this other lady's house and attach a push mower so she could use it when we were done. One thing to note is it was a very clear night out. All the stars were out. And as I was walking back to her house, I looked up in the sky and saw the bright stars above me. I think the one I was looking at is the North Star, I think. I kind of just get stuck in a moment of looking at all the stars and realizing, wow, there are so many. And the night seems to be brighter than usual, with the moon full and all the stars out since it was a beautiful, clear summer night. Everything seemed to be brimming. So I start pushing the mower over that direction to the other lady's house to get the push mower attachment. Now, the direction to this lady's house is down a couple of blocks. To get to it, you need to cross a couple of streets and past an older cul-de-sac. On this cul-de-sac, there is a few houses, there's a section of woods, and not much else besides that. I would also like to state Reddit that I walk by this old cul-de-sac more often than not, have never once had any sort of strange experiences other than this one night. So I walk by it, and movement catches my attention. Now there's also something else to note. In this cul-de-sac, usually 
most cul-de-sacs are littered with several houses. I don't know what the average number is, but this only has three. There is a couple that are newly developed, and I think a couple that are just empty plots of land. I can only assume that these houses were freshly built and nobody had moved into them yet. Or perhaps they were not ready to be moved into yet. I'm not exactly sure. Either way, nobody was in them. And so I look over at the movement that has now caught my attention. And I see this white, shapeless figure walking towards me. And I stop for a moment to let my eyes adjust. The streetlight is right above me. And so that definitely messes with my eyesight. And so I'm squinting to see what this could be. It kind of looked like a blanket or something swinging in the wind. So when I say shapeless, I mean shapeless. And at first, I maybe thought it was a trash bag or something blowing, but it seemed almost to be swaying back and forth, slowly approaching my direction. But another thing I noticed right away is that it was sort of translucent. And so I'm sitting there staring at it, trying to figure what it is that I'm looking at. And I can't make up any conclusion. It's just moving closer and closer in my direction slowly swaying back and forth and moving ever so slowly. I don't see any legs, any arms, any head, just this white, translucent, shapeless figure. And it's coming from the area where the woods were, and it has now reached the road where the cul-de-sac is. I decide that now is probably a good time to keep going and just ignore whatever this is. So, I don't think about it. I ignore it. I get to the lady's house and get the push more attachment and do what I need to do to head back to my house, which is back the other direction. So, after some conversation, it had been maybe roughly 25 minutes since I first passed that old cul-de-sac. So I'm walking by it again, and I just happen to look over. I don't see anything there. It must have just been my imagination. But as I'm walking by it, I get this really strange sensation over me, almost as if I shouldn't be there. I've never gotten that feeling before. It was the oddest feeling I've ever had. It's like if you go to somewhere and you just get this bad feeling that you need to leave. That's kind of what it was, but the feeling just hit me like a brick wall about halfway into the road as I'm walking to the other sidewalk to get away from the cul-de-sac. So, I didn't spend much more time walking through there. I quickly got back home and that was the end of that. Is it possible that I saw an alien or maybe some sort of apparition? possibly a ghost. For other information, this took place in the summer of 2011 in Madras, Oregon. This all started with me, driving down the road on my way back from work. Everything was pretty normal, until the sound of a faint howl came from the woods on my right-hand side. And being out in the country, you hear wolves and coyotes all the time, but this was no wolf. It sounded distorted, more deeper and more animalistic than you'd expect to hear at all. A few seconds later, one of the most god-awful things I've ever seen burst out of the tree line, running right towards my vehicle. By god-awful, I mean it looked like something that belonged in a horror movie and not of this world. Immediately, I'm thinking, what kind of bear is that? It's humongous. But this thing is running right towards my vehicle. I have to practically slam on the brakes and swerve the vehicle out of the way to avoid hitting this thing head on. About midway from the tree line to my vehicle, this thing goes from running on all fours to up running on two legs, like a large humanoid bear. And as fast as it appeared, it took off running past my car as I sit there dazed trying to understand what just happened. But, as it had made its way past my vehicle, everything in my car died. The battery, the electronics, my phone, everything had shut off. I was a sitting duck, waiting for something bad to happen while this thing was out lurking around. To say I was scared out of my mind is a huge understatement. I was on the brink of a full-blown mental meltdown. I was so terrified. Even my OnStar didn't work. And I sat there for a good amount of time, too. At least ten minutes, from what I can recall. Until a sweet passerby came by and saw me, swerved on the side of the road. I waved him down and even offered to jump my car. The only issue is, 
My battery was not taking any juice at all. The engine wouldn't even start to rev up, no matter if you turn the keys. It's as if whatever that bare thing was that had ran past my car had killed my car somehow without even hitting it. And the stranger, a sweet old man, was kind enough to let me use his cell phone and call for a tow truck. I had told the gentleman what had happened and explained to him a large bear had ran by my car and if he wouldn't mind keeping me company until the tow truck got there. Surprisingly, he said yes. After all, I was only a 19-year-old female. He agreed that a young lady like me was not safe stranded out here in the middle of the country. Once the tow truck came, I briefly explained what happened, but he seemed pretty expressionless. Once I got back to town and the tow truck dropped my vehicle off, everything turned back on like normal. Nothing was damaged, even my phone. Even the battery was full. There's nothing I know that can explain how the events went on that night, and I'm not even really sure I want an explanation. I was driving northbound on Highway 199, headed to the town of Selma, where I live. It was around 2 in the morning, and I had just finished up closing at the restaurant where I work as a manager. My two employees were scheduled for that day off and had called off as such, so we had been extremely busy all day long, and we had just finished up with happy hour. We were about five miles north of Selma when we first saw it. As we're driving along the highway, I look up and see this large disc-shaped object that's similar to a plane, flying very low to us, going faster. It appeared to have no lights on it, and was speeding up and accelerating. It very quickly zoomed in front of us, got very low to the ground, and then shot up very high in the sky. My friend, panicking, throwing his cigarette down in the car, out of sheer surprise and shock at what we were looking at. He began screaming, It's an alien. I was in shock. I looked up at it. I lost sight of it for a moment, and then all of a sudden, it was right in front of us. It was huge. It appeared to be the size of a commercial aircraft, but no lights anywhere on it. It slowed down to maybe 20 miles an hour and began moving past our car alongside of us for roughly 500 yards before stopping suddenly again. Then, it suddenly stopped and just hovered there in front of us. At that point, we were all screaming. My friend sped up the car to try to get away from this thing, but it followed us and easily kept up with us at 55, then 70, then 80. It was faster than any plane. It shot off in front of us again and began moving away from us. Its shape began to shift and contort. Now, it wasn't round like a saucer. It was more pointed, like an arrowhead with two very large wings coming out the side of it, almost like a triangle but not perfect. The bottom also had appeared to be some sort of large exhaust venting of the bottom that were forming into three lights, a bright white color. It shot off in the sky and disappeared after some time. My friends and I weren't sure what to do at that point. Had we just seen an alien, or is this some sort of military craft that was kept secret by the government, or were we visited by something else? My friends and I had talked about this for quite some time after. We thought that maybe we should call and report this to somebody, but please, who is going to believe us? The police would have just laughed in our faces. Nothing we can do anyway. Anyway, that's the end of my story. And I don't know if it was aliens or not, but it certainly creeped us out. I spent a lot of my time growing up around Bend, Oregon. I knew the back roads there like the palm of my hand. The time I'm about to share with you took place when I was about 17. I wasn't driving, but was riding in the car with three other people at the time that it happened. We were headed to my parents' house located on some property backing up to the National Forest Land. And just as we got onto the highway that leads to their house, we saw something in the woods. As we got closer, we could make out two large white figures, and they were moving very strangely. Their bodies were also very disproportionate. I pointed it out to my friends, and we weren't exactly sure what we were seeing. One of my friends suggested that they were ghosts. I jokingly said that they were aliens, but we weren't sure. They kind of waddled as they moved, and they waddled back 
towards where we couldn't see them. And my friend got the bright idea that we should go investigate. You know, like the paranormal investigators do. Although this time, we were actually chasing something because we had all seen it. We should have realized that this was a bad idea to begin with. We were young, dumb, being completely invigorated with bad ideas. Back behind where these things disappeared off to is an old well that's boarded up that has not been used by our family in many, many years. I don't remember what was wrong with it, but for some reason when I was young, my father had boarded it up. It's possible the well dried up or what, but I don't know too much about wells or how they work. I just know that it was no longer in use. Also back there is an old settlement, or what's left of it. The remnants of a dilapidated house, which I assume hundreds of years ago, or maybe even less than, is where the original house was built, hence the well being close by. So we park the car, get out some big flashlights, grab our cell phones, and anything else that we might need. I was kind of excited more than I was scared, believe it or not. I think we all realized that we probably saw a ghost, or something. What we saw definitely was no animal, or some sort of person. So we climb over the fence, and we make our way across the field back to the tree line where we saw these things initially. We step in the woods, and we make our way back towards the old, boarded-up well that is no longer used. This is the direction we saw these two things go off to. My friend mentions that we probably saw the ghost that used to live here long ago. But as far as I know, I don't have any information on who used to live there long before our house was built, the original settlement. So now we finally get back to the old, boarded-up well and the old, dilapidated settlement, and... It's kind of creepy. The only feeling I can describe is eyes watching you around every corner. I'd been back here several times before, but it's not a place that I'd spent a lot of time, especially growing up. Sure, I'd played back here before, but my dad always forbid it. I mean, it is kind of dangerous. There's old broken glass and tools and just a bunch of old junk that has been rotting here for years and years and years. I think it was kind of left to rot, back in the early 1900s, so if I had to guess, maybe the house was built in the 1800s, although I don't know too much of the history of Bend, Oregon and when it was established, and or when settlements were built outside of Bend, so that's going to be my guess. Even my friend mentioned the creepy atmosphere, and how it felt like we were being watched all around. After a whole lot of nothing happening, I'd asked my friend how long he planned on staying out here, but he told me, until something did happen, or until those things showed themselves. At this point, I decided to adios. We were planning to go to my parents' house anyway, and I did not want to keep my parents waiting. They were probably wondering why we skipped going inside the house and walked all the way back here. My friend mentioned not to tell them what we had seen, just because they probably wouldn't believe us. I mean, he's not wrong. My dad was kind of a pain in the butt. Never really believed anything other than what he could physically see. Even if somebody had the most elaborate, detailed encounter of something, it wouldn't matter. He was like this several times growing up when I had seen a gargantuan black bear. Didn't even believe me. So he decides that I'm right, and we all go inside, hanging out with my parents, just chit-chatting away. And my friend taps me on the shoulder and points. We see those same two figures again, and they're running, they look like people, but with really long white legs, and they're naked and pale, and extremely disproportionate, long arms and really long heads, and they're kind of hunched over, and they're running in a group. Now they're running back in the opposite direction from where the old dilapidated house is. It just creeped me out, and my dad, of course, was sitting right there having a cup of coffee talking to me. I should have pointed it out to him, but even then, the old man would still probably deny it. I should have gone investigating, but I just didn't have a desire to. As the evening time drew to an end, I decided it was time to wrap things up, and we all drove back to our apartment. After doing some more research, my friend is convinced that we have crawlers out there, but I don't know. Hey, I heard you're from Washington State, so I'll go ahead and assume that you know a lot of Oregon too. Forgive me if you don't, but I grew up in the beach town of Cannon Beach, 
when I was in my 20s. I moved with my fiancé to Tillamook, where we were married, and started a family. I'm still there to this day. My story begins when I was 10, growing up in Cannon Beach. I'll be up front and say I don't remember much of this period of my life overall, but what I do remember sets the stage for the story. My dad was a fisherman, taking us out on his boat when we were young, often too. My dad not only fished in the ocean, but also fished on all the nearby rivers and lakes. He was very avid about the sport and really enjoyed fishing. Me, not so much. But, as much as I didn't care for it, it was something that we could do together and bond. I remember being out in the ocean with him one time when I saw something in the distance. On first glance, I thought it was a buoy from a boat, broken loose and possibly floating in the water. My dad must have seen my concerned look. He mentioned that there wasn't any boats nearby, and certainly no buoys out here or anywhere near us. That's when I realized that this thing in the water looked alive. It sort of undulated, waves going up and down its height. My brain didn't want to process what I was seeing, but my eyes wouldn't be tricked by what my mind wanted them to see. An animate object out in the ocean. I don't feel like I was ever truly scared of the ocean until that point. Being out there, that sort of ring figure in the water made me realize how alone in the ocean we were and how I had no idea what we were looking at. Even my dad was saying, man, I've never seen anything like that before. We thought maybe it was a jellyfish, but it looked far too strange. I can't even begin to describe to you its movements and the way it looked. Its appearance looked very foreign and alien. And the more its body began to shift and undulate under the water, the larger it became, more and more, like a blanket stretching out. After a minute or two of staring at this thing, it began to slowly drift towards our boat, which immediately alarmed my dad as if this thing was danger. Without saying a word, he went and kick-started the engine and started to head back towards shore. Whatever it was out there really spooked him. I could tell by the look on his face. Even though he wasn't so much verbal about it, he definitely showed it in his actions. I was more confused. I had never seen an object or an animal or creature like this before in my life. And once we got back to shore, I kept pressing him and bothering him. What was that out there? Or was it an object? Was it seaweed? Was it a jellyfish? But he wouldn't respond to me. He just flat out would not answer. That's when I knew something was really up. It's not like my father. And even the nights following this, I would have horrible nightmares about this object coming closer and closer while we were on the boat. He too also mentioned having dreams about this thing, or being surrounded by darkness under the water. Which I thought was very strange for my dad. Even his behavior after this sort of slightly changed. He became more open about his thoughts and nightmares, which he never, ever did. But I guess this was not the first time or last time my father saw it, since it is all I could refer to it as. He had many and several fishing spots, but he had been mentioning, ever since this thing has showed itself, many of the fish around his fishing spots have disappeared entirely. Not exactly sure what that's about. Keep in mind, though, that he wasn't very open with me. He would share these little bits of details here and there, but ultimately keeping very closed off. And now that we're in 2021, my father has been passed away for over 10 years now. All the way up to his death, he never admitted seeing what was out there in the water. He wanted me to forget about it and move on with my life, like it didn't happen, because this was such a strange occurrence and the nightmares were so consistent. Even though really what we saw in the water was more strange and alien and was never really frightening to begin with, but there's just something about the whole surrounding event that just didn't sit right with me. Growing up in Salem was the bane of my teenage years. I got into a lot of drugs and mischief, but that's for another time. Today, I wanted to share with you about a story that happened to me. Me and my friends were just leaving the arcade. It was roughly 1987 to 1988. I was 14 at the time. It was a Saturday, and probably somewhere around 8pm. We decided to take the long way home and cut 
to this old trailer park. I don't remember why we decided to cut through here. It was a mistake in hindsight. It's always been a bad idea. The crime and theft around this trailer park was tremendous. And my friend supposedly had friends there, so he knew it well and did not mind walking through it. And as we made our way down through the back section of this trailer park, I began to feel very uneasy. The place itself gave me the creeps, especially with some of the people living there, but it was also dark, and I just wasn't comfortable. As we're making our way towards the end of the trailer park, reaching the other sidewalk, across the road, directly ahead of us is a bike path that goes about a 3-4 mile loop. We can see somebody who's very tall and all dark, walking in our direction, which is nothing strange at all. They're probably just walking back to the trailer park or walking back in this direction. We did not think anything of it right away. But the closer this figure came, the more fidgety and strange their movements seemed to be. I pointed this out to my friend immediately, who thought I was just being overly paranoid, until he saw the movements himself and thought how strange they were. I can tell it definitely freaked him out. So we tried to hurry a little faster and just get to the end of the parking lot. A small parking lot attached to the trailer park. This is where it gets crazy. So right as we're about to hit the end of the parking lot, we see this person come right to the end of the bike path, right where it conjoins onto the sidewalk onto the road. And instantaneously, we see them go down on all fours and crawl away like a spider at breakneck speeds. This sends my friend and I screaming, running away in the opposite direction, having no idea what kind of person acts this way, or even can perform that physically. Even looking back on it, it sends shivers down my spine. It was completely inhuman. And when I think about it, I don't think it was a person. I think it was something else. Now, I'm not sure exactly what it could be, but it scares me to reflect on. The year was 2005, and for my 18th birthday, I decided to go on a weekend camping trip with my friends at the Deschutes River State Recreation Area. My mom even went through all the trouble, reserving us a very nice campsite. It was my 18th birthday, and she wanted to make it special, surprisingly allowing just me and my friends, which meant no adult supervision, and I feel like that can only go so far without bringing in drugs and alcohol and, you know, all the other stuff that 18-year-olds do, which we did do. But that's besides the fact that the story happened. The Deschutes River State Recreation Area is pretty mountainous and pretty open. It runs right along the Columbia River Gorge, and it's just a few miles east of the town at the Dalles, which is on the Oregon side. Many people come here for hiking, fishing, biking, and of course camping, so I thought, what better place than to have a bash? We decided to all show up fairly early, about 4 to 5 p.m. in the evening, just spending time eating, walking around, hanging out, joking. Trust me, at 18 years old, we had plans to bust out the booze, but that was not going to be until after dark. We wanted to save the fun times for when we could be more sneaky about it. After all, you learn a lot of tricks when you're trying to indulge in underage drinking, and we knew all of them. About 7 o'clock, we came back and actually set up our tents, which only consisted of three. There were six of us in total, two of us to a tent. We even got ready for a fire and got all of our food out, because when we came back from hiking, we were going to be pretty hungry. So we hiked around some more, explored a little bit, and sat by the river just talked. Finally, about 8 to 8.30, as it's beginning to get pretty dusk outside, we decided it's best to turn back to camp and let the night ventures really begin. After getting back to camp, starting a fire, and eating some good dinner, which was some ribs that we bought, and some pulled pork, along with some brisket, we had a fantastic dinner, laughed a bunch, and 9 p.m. rolled around, so we broke out the beers. All of us had several. Now, rolls around 10.30, maybe 10.45. Two of us are ready to turn in for bed. 
but I'm actually still wired just from the adrenaline of the day and overstimulated, even though I'm about two and a half years in, which I know is not a lot, but go easy on me. I was 18. I was pacing myself. I was buzzed, but I'm a bigger guy, so I certainly was not drunk or completely inebriated. If I needed to, I could definitely function. Not enough to drive, though, of course. My one friend, who I'll call Davis, he was about six beers in and, well, he was pretty gone. Not asleep, though, just pretty drunk. My other friend, who only had about one beer, he was pretty good, much more of a lightweight than I am. After about 15 more minutes rolls around, I remember it being close to about 11 p.m., and I was still amped up from adrenaline and stimulation. I just said, hey guys, we should go out walking around, out in the dark, with minimal lights. I think it'd be kind of fun. Maybe also spooky. The friends of mine that were awake completely agreed, and so we got up, left our fire unattended, which was a mistake, but it was only burning very low, so I thought it was fine. We kind of went off exploring, or what little we could explore in the dark, with only our phones. At several moments in, a couple of my friends kept saying, Oh, there's a shadow. And we'd laugh. Oh, there's another shadow. And we'd laugh some more. We even walked down to the Columbia River, which, in the dark, was beautiful, with the stars and moon illuminating the silvery water top. It's magnificent. This was turning out to be the best 18th birthday I could have asked for. After a while... We decided now that it was about midnight to 12.30, we should probably turn in for bed. We could stay up later, but we'd want to do more hiking tomorrow and see what we could explore. So we made our way back to the campsite about 20 or so minutes later, walking slowly, taking our time and trying to be as quiet as possible. Once we get back to camp, we all say goodnight and pile into our respective tents each. After climbing in and taking a while to get situated, I always have a hard time getting comfortable. It's like me and sleeping bags sometimes just don't always agree with each other. Well, after shuffling for some time, I can't help but fight the urge that I had to go pee really bad. So, I used my phone as a flashlight, jumped up, and got out of my tent. Walked over to where the toilet was. I did my business. Walked back to the tent. And as I'm getting in, I noticed that somebody was watching us from not too far away off by one of the trees. I ignored it at first, thinking it was my friend who had snuck out of the tent while I went to the bathroom, trying to pull a prank on me. He was the same one who kept joking about shadows earlier before, and saying that we're supposed to get spooked, and then we'd all laugh it off. Well, I simply ignored it, got in the tent and zipped it up. But as I'm struggling again to get comfortable, and get situated in my sleeping bag, that feeling in my gut persists, like... I am being watched. So, after five minutes of this going on, I decide to humor it. So I peek outside the tent flap. And sure enough, that figure is still there. At this point, I'm thinking, okay, I've had enough of his crap. Now I'm tired, and I want to go to bed. So I quietly called out to his name. But the only issue is, I thought he was over there, and he responded. He was actually half asleep and he was in the tent next to mine, and he had asked me, what's up? I said, that's not you over by the tree, is it? And he asked me, what are you talking about? I said, there's someone or something watching us from over that tree over there. Don't look out of your tent flap. And so what does he do? He opens up his tent flap and looks out, and we both see the strange figure watching us. Now, the one thing we noticed right off the bat is this person was very, very large and very bulky, like they were wearing a huge bulky fur coat. It didn't really make much sense, and their head was kind of pointed. We sat there for quite some time, maybe five or ten more minutes, just watching this figure stand totally still, looking in our direction. And it had to have been at us. We were the only tent site around. There's nothing else it could have been looking at. I would be lying if I said we weren't terrified. It was either a monster or somebody who was going to come and murder us. Why were they standing there so still and for so long? What did they want? 
and eventually, they let go their hand on the tree and moved very slowly across the grassy knoll, off in the distance, disappearing for good. Me and my friend kept talking. We didn't know what that was about, why they were watching us, or what that had to do. But at this point, we were the only two awake, and we were the only two that saw it. I don't think either of us slept well that night, and the following morning, we bothered to not bring it up to the rest of our friends. Best to not scare them. After all, the rest of that day was going to be better, and we hoped that that night, nothing would happen. Fortunately, as the night came around again, that night was calm, and we had a really good time. We never saw what that was, and we could only guess that it was some creepo or some creature, and possibly a Bigfoot, judging by the size, but I really don't know. What I can tell you is from the lighting that I had and what I could see, it was either a giant man or something else. Not my story, but actually my uncle's, who had gone camping in Central Oregon back in the 1960s. This was right before the whole revolution. You know, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. So, I want to say 64 or 65, but he's old, and he can't recall the exact year. I guess that's irrelevant. Anyway, he always tells me how far out in the middle of nowhere they were. Like, way far out in the backcountry. He never did specify where in Central Oregon they were, but back then, a lot less development was going on. A lot less houses and neighborhoods and commercial zones. A lot more wilderness, so to speak. He actually kind of hints at it being the southern section of where Mount Hood is. So, probably closer north to Pine Grove. If you don't know where that is, just Google it, and you'll know what I mean. Somewhere I'm going to say between Pine Grove and Rock Creek. That'd probably get you in the ballpark of where he was. He tells me that after about four hours of hiking in, they reached this large glade, which they thought would be the perfect time to sit down, have some water, and just relax. They had already been hiking for about three to four hours without a break. Talk about crazy. I'm sure a lot of experienced hikers could do this, but me, I'm not so much an outdoorsy person, so that's got to take a lot of physical stamina. Anyway, he's sitting down, rejuvenating with ice-cold water that he had collected from a nearby creek, when he begins to feel something different. He couldn't really explain it, but he described it as a presence was around him. Of course, the woods are filled with deer, bears, and all sorts of wild critters, but this was something different. This had a peculiar, ominous feeling to it, and it really bothered him. He stopped drinking his water and became very alert to his surroundings, expecting something bad to happen. The feeling of this presence seems to intensify, and it really makes my uncle very uncomfortable. The way he described it to me is, do you ever know when something bad is going to happen? How you can just sense it beforehand, like you feel it's going to happen. That's what it was like, and he was just filled full of anxiety, waiting for this to happen, or it to show itself. He actually had assumed that it was somebody who was trying to run them off the property, or possibly run them off the land, which they could have used for hunting, but it was just a wild guess. He decides in that moment that his best course of action is to get up from that spot and continue on down deeper into the forest, which is where he was planning on, hiking a few more miles in, which is what he planned. Now, the forest around him continued to stay silent and very eerie, the presence never left. In fact, he claims it followed him, all the way down several miles deep, which he tells me whatever it was, whatever the presence was, took notice of him when he decided to take a rest in that glade, regretting him ever resting there, that he claims he somehow drew its attention, but he never referred to it exactly as what it was. Now, by the late afternoon, he had reached several miles back to his endpoint, in which he had planned to loop around and turn around, heading back, being back just before eight. And when he gets to this end portion of the trail, he begins to hear something a little unnerving that catches him off guard. The presence that was following him, he believes was responsible for this. He began to hear a voice calling out to him, Help me. 
He said when he first heard it, he was a little taken aback and startled, as the voice did not sound normal, but very distressed. He ignored it at first, because of how close it seemed, only a little far off in the trees. But then it happened again. Help me. And he looked around, yelling back, What do you need? Who are you? Nothing but silence. The woods this entire time had been eerily quiet, the same as before, and that presence, that feeling, still lingering around him. His good Samaritan nature wanted him to go into those woods and find that person who needed help, but his insides were screaming no, that it was a bad idea, that it wasn't really what it seemed. So he started heading up to the tree line to investigate the cries, but as he approached the tree line, he heard it again, help me, this time deeper and lower in pitch, but also more south towards the other portion of woods, about 200 feet away from where he was, which is impossible. He had just heard the noise coming from in here, not even two minutes ago, and now the noise is coming from down there. Everything on his insides just screamed no, and he made a quick decision in that moment it was just best to turn around and leave. He makes it about 300 yards away from that tree line, and he hears the voice shit again, only deeper than ever. Help me, George. His name was George, and as soon as my uncle had heard this voice use his actual name, that was enough. That sent him from walking at a good pace to running. My uncle was a very fit young man, and so he probably ran a good two or three miles on top of that, all the way back to where the glade was where he initially rested for a while. And he tells me at the speed in which he moved, he probably got back around 6 to 6.30, and double-timed it all the way back home. For my uncle during this time, eight-hour-long treks in the woods was nothing for him. He would usually hike three to four hours in, and then turn around and do three to four hours back, sometimes reaching up to about 12 to 13 miles in a day. So when I say he went into the backcountry, he really went there. And you gotta think, back then, with all the remote wilderness and lack of development, things back then were pretty wild. Five miles in the woods and you're out in the middle of nowhere. He swears this story is true and knows that nobody was back there that could possibly have been with him or knew him. And he still shudders when he tells me how this thing's voice changed from what sounded like a normal person to dropping in pitch, sounding evil. He never used the words demon or ghost, but I could tell. He's incredibly frightened every time he tells this part of the story. It really bothered him.